So, thank you. Thank you uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I'm, yes, I'm Brian Matthews. I'm scientific computing department. Uh, I'm not a crystallographer, so I'm, and in fact, um, we're actually kind of two steps removed from the actual crystallography or, or the actual experimental teams. So I'm, I'm actually not going to talk much about, about, about I don't think I mentioned crystallography once in this talk. So. Um, also, um, some of you may have seen some of this before because uh, my colleague Erica Yang gave, has given, presented at previous meetings of this group. Um, and some of the slides are similar, but I thought I would repeat some of it because I know there's new people here. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, right, so I'm going to talk about a variety of things. So what are, what are we doing now? Um, what do we want to do? What are, um, and, and in two different aspects, particularly supporting user workflows, uh, and sharing and publishing data. And finally, co um, come back to metadata. This is, a talk, this is a, converse, a workshop about metadata, so I thought I would have some comments about approaches to metadata. Um, with some things you want to do there. So what do we do now? So raw data management. So, so my job is in the scientific computing department, STFC. We have a data center at the Rutherford Atherton Laboratory campus, which is at the top there, uh, our building uh, with the machine room. And uh, amongst many other things we do, we support the three uh, STFC funding facilities on the RAL cam campus. That's uh, the ISIS neutral immune source, the di uh, diamond uh, synchrotron light source, uh, and the central laser facility. Um, and what we do for them is provide um, data archive and management tools, so data storing and archiving, uh, and um, a variety of, of management tools to manage that data around our, which around a, a common uh, core set and common core expertise. So what we do for them is actually all slightly different. Uh, each facility has different requirements. So for ISIS, we provide tools that that are supporting. The, the, the data workflows, they, they go through much more intimately, um, right through their scientific life cycle from proposal to uh, experimental collection and beyond. Uh, so there's much more richer metadata there, uh, from our point of view at least. Um, uh, but we also provide data archiving in, in our building. While for the diamond synchrotron, we actually have a much, our, our role is rather more limited. Um, uh, much more to do with data archiving. So actually, we store much more, much less metadata. It doesn't mean Diamond doesn't collect a lot of metadata, but we actually store less. The the interesting um, or challenging uh, part from from our point of view of, of what what Diamond bring is real challenges in scale and how to scale up the archive. They they have data rates and data sizes which are much more, which are, which are significantly challenging, much more so than the ISIS. Neutron uh, source. So different kind of uh, features of our, our infrastructures are, are tested by the two different uh, big facilities. I, we also do some work for central laser facility, a, a rather smaller facility, uh, which is much more to do with real-time data management and feedback to users uh, with quite rich metadata and laser configuration. Um, uh, I won't talk about the laser facility any more than, than that. Um, I'll concentrate on ISIS and Diamond, the ones with the most interest here. So this is a, a kind of a picture of the kind of thing we, we do, uh, the infrastructure we supply for the, the Diamond arch um, archive. Uh, so uh, data is streamed, well, is passed over from the data collection systems, the lustre file systems that, that Diamond run um, through a system called Storage D, which is a, a storage daemon essentially to a uh, to store data on onto tape, um, but also to capture metadata as we go along to a system we call the iCat, and I'll talk the iCat. I mean, a few people have mentioned the iCat already, and this is uh, I'll talk a lot about the iCat during this talk. And then we provide tools for data access uh, through a, a web front end uh, and through some downloader systems and through data data browsers. Now, I mentioned that the challenges we're getting through Diamond Diamond archiving are are to do with scale rather than complexity of metadata from our point of view. Uh, so we're, we're, we're currently, or rather as of July, it keeps creeping up, we're about 3.3 petabytes of data in total. So we've captured all the data that Diamond produced so far. Uh, eight, uh, and in a vast number of files, Diamond is very file rich. So it's not just a total volume, it's also just the sheer number of items. Um, you know, 846 million files. Uh, and this is really increasing enormously. Um, uh, Six months before this, it was it was, uh, was two-thirds size. It's half as much again in, in, in six months. 
Uh, so a real, a real challenge for us. Uh, and, uh, and real fast rates, having to, you know, going through 12,000 files per, per minute uh, to, to catalogue them all. And that, that, that doesn't keep up with the rates we're getting sometimes. So a real challenge in scale uh, on the system, which really, really pushes us at the moment. Uh, this graph at the bottom is, uh, is how the data rates are increasing. So it raises questions for Diamond about how they will sustain us now that and there's cost implications for all this, but this is what we're doing at the moment. And I think there's a talk next on Diamond, so I won't talk much about, more about that. Um, so um, to go back to kind of how we do this in general, uh, we have to build these data pipelines for, for managing this data. Um, I've said different situations for different facilities, but around a common set of tools. So we've been, uh, as several people already mentioned, we've been building a system over several years now, which we call the ICAT, uh, which is essentially a catalog of experimental data. So it's a metadata catalog which captures information about experiments. Um, uh, and this has developed over the last few years into a set of tools. Uh, so it's not just one single catalog, it's, it's become a, a much wider set of tools which we use. And these tools are quite buried quite deeply in our infrastructure. So they're not seen as uh, tools which are kind of sit on top of your data and pre present things to a, to a user. They are quite deeply embedded into the, into the uh, uh, information management systems, data management systems, um, as mu doing as much automatic metadata capture as possible, so particularly from proposal systems, particularly um, extracting out of files, particularly um, data acquisition systems from instruments. Uh, so we don't have to depend on the user too much to, to, to provide metadata, to stream off as we can. Uh, and to do that, it's integrated in the user op systems, integrated into data acquisition systems, so it has that feature of being very deeply embedded. Uh, and then that metadata itself can then be used during subsequent processing uh, to control the way things uh, are, act, uh, um, are subsequently uh, accessed and, uh, and uh, used. So it has this notion of uh, active metadata, which, uh, which Simon mentioned earlier, um, uh, or metadata as middleware, where it's, it, it, it doesn't just isn't just a user thing; it's it's, it's part of the information system itself. Uh, and we provide, we do provide front end to the user as well. As a separate tool, which is integrated with the ICAT, which works with the ICAT, the TopCat, um, uh, but we can also integrate it into uh, other tools through APIs, uh, particularly uh, data analysis frameworks like Mantid for neutrons and Dawn for, for X-rays. Um, so this is kind of a kind of schematic which were used for a while. So the ICAT is a um, well, essentially a database, really. Uh, but it is designed to provide flexible data searching. It's provided to to capture information right through a, a pipeline of a of um, the process from so from the, when proposals are submitted and accepted through uh, scheduling information through uh, the experimental setup, uh, data collection, data acquisition and collection and storage, uh, and then. Uh, also capturing information for subsequent uh, uh, analysis, derived data, uh, and finally publications. Now, there's some lines are, are uh, solid lines, some lines are dotted lines. The, the solid lines are where things are, are heavily automated. The dotted lines are where things are less automated. Um, well, uh, so I mentioned some of these reasons. Mentioned data analysis tools are meant to be scalable and extensible, and, and uh, hopefully. Uh, and it's found up to manage, to manage the data rates we, we're having to deal with. Uh, we can access high performance resources through it, so HPC systems, uh, link to other outputs, so, so the sort of thing that Susanna's mentioned, we'll be linking to other research outputs we can manage through the system. And data policy aware, which is something I'll mention a little bit later as well. The core of it is a metadata model, uh, which we call the CSMD, the, the core scientific metadata model. Um, uh, which is a relatively simple model uh, for experimental, uh, for experiments, and very general as well. It's, it's centered around this notion of investigation, which is our notion of an experiment, or particularly an experiment on a facility. It has quite a close relationship with the proposal, um, but that can also have sub-experiments as well. Uh, that has associated with, um, with investigators, with people, people teams, is best associated with, with instruments, uh, associated with, um, 
the context the experiment was done, so the, the proposal itself associated with um, authorization conditions, and then when you go through the experiment, it's associated with samples, experimental settings, and then data sets and data, data files. So you can link all these things together. Then these, these all these very general things at the side, in, on the, on the right-hand side there called, uh, called parameters. So this is, this is a kind of very structural way of looking at metadata, very quite high level, very general, uh, and all the very specific domain specific um, uh, parts are kind of hidden in these uh, data set, these parameter fields, which are, from our point of view, very free. So we can capture any kind of domain specific metadata in them in general. So uh, one area we might want to do is, is make more detail in that area. So there's some of the work that Andy got talking about yesterday, capturing parameter sets and from Nexus would help us give us much more detail in that. So that's, from our point of view, it's a very interesting area. So that's some uh, uh, URLs about where to find more information about the model. Uh, as I mentioned, NICAT is now a, a, a tool suite. So there's a whole, whole bunch of tools associated with it. Um, so the ICAT core at the bottom is essentially a database. It's an Oracle database or a MySQL database. Um, and then there's a series of APIs and uh, client server model APIs which you can do different authorization. And then everything's quite, plug, quite plug, pluggable and flexible, so you can plug in different authorization plugins. Uh, we've, we've got a separate web interface, which is uh, a, a separate tool. We've been changing that a lot recently, so there's a new version coming out very soon. And then there's other tools associated on the, on the left-hand side, which we've been building. I catch our portal, which we'll talk about later, uh, about accessing HPC uh, and other applications. And IDS, which is a, a tool we've added very recently, which separates the whole data handling aspect, which is very, which is, which is a kind of a crucial adjunct for the whole uh, metadata system. And on the right hand side, there are tools that are contributed by other people, aren't, aren't done by the core team, but are, are, are sort of contributed. So, with Python interfaces, ICAT manager, back administrating ICAT, uh, and then it's linked through to analysis systems like Dawn and Mantid. Um, I mentioned the ICAT data server, which is a fairly recent tool. This has kind of been done in response to this kind of data scaling problem where we've separated out the, the whole data uh, ingest and, uh, um, and access component from, from ICAT, um, which but uses the same authentication and, and, and the model which ICAT use, uses for, for the data. So we, we, can, we can provide scalable services for this. One thing we particularly added to this is data transfer services as well. So it's not just uploading and data, downloading data to, to storage media, we can then package it up to provide it to uh, transfer elsewhere, which is a real problem for us. So we can provide HTTP transfer, but we can also provide by more um, uh, performant protocols like Globus Online. Uh, so so uh, uh, help get, uh, with these, some of these very large data transfer problems we're getting. So ICAT is now an international collaboration, uh, open source project. It's in data production and use on the RAL campus, but also now internationally. Uh, Andy mentioned the work at ESRF. Um, ILL have also been using it um, at Oak Ridge and various other places have been looking at it as well um, and actively contributing. Uh, Andy Fox is now head of our Syrian committee um, uh, of an open source uh, um, uh, project. And again, the URL is there. Okay, so where do we want to go from here? Supporting work, uh, work well, two things really. Well, firstly, is supporting workflows more in a more rich manner. Um, so traditionally, facilities do the first part of this. So this is a kind of a life cycle view, another life cycle view of, uh, of what we do from proposal to publication. Traditionally, facilities are pretty good at handling the left-hand side, the early stages, but, but don't provide a great deal of support on data analysis and, and uh, steps, which are usually left to the user. The user Takes, uh, user takes data home and do what they like with it. Um, however, this is kind of key for defining user insight, and this is where these things start, are starting to break down somewhat. So this data analysis challenge is becoming much, much greater. We're finding that, the, well, we have to manage very wide areas of science, but also hugely varying different levels of expertise from real, ex, real kind of hackers and uh, Code developers right through to almost people who just want to be given a final data, final result. Um, so people need a lot more help. Data is getting so much bigger, so it becomes very hard to move, very hard to store at users' institutions. Uh, they, the uh, software uh, requirements are becoming much more complex than the software itself, but also 
much, much more compute intense as well. Again, we have very variable uh, capabilities at user institutions, uh, and we have to deal with the whole tracking of provenance and the use, as, as uh, already mentioned. Um, so we have serious problems in the data analysis area, and this is an area where uh, facilities are beginning to focus on. Uh, so we've been looking at how we might provide more support for data analysis, uh, the, these parts of the workflows, so we've been modifying the ICAT to, to, to handle the provenance information of, that, of, of, a, of derived jobs and derived data and software and, and, and access to HPC. We've been putting that into a variety of tools. So these, these three tools, Mantid already mentioned, so Mantid will, 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 will launch jobs and, and um, uh, you know, give results, but, but that was also re all recorded by the ICAT. The ICAT job portal is another system which is, um, uh, again, launching jobs me mediated by the ICAT, They're launching jobs onto your HPC system of choice. Um, uh, and, and ISIS have got water reduction systems so people can run their water reduction jobs you know, through a very, very simple interface. And it's actually also a mobile interface of this kind of way, all using the ICAT to access data and record provenance. So we're beginning to provide tools to do all these things. In general, and I know this slide was done last time, we, we realize that there's, a, big, there's a, a general problem we can solve here where we can use our high performance infrastructure uh, in scientific computing to support pipelines uh, for um, uh, uh, particular fields, particularly, particularly data intensive fields. So we're concentrating on tomography, concentrating on tomography at the moment though. MX is an area which we also want to do fairly soon down the line. Um, so this is where we would provide the whole pipeline, the whole data analysis pipeline within the, within the uh, computing center access in our HPC. Um, and we're making significant progress in this, so this is all being set up now, and so when the IMAC instrument comes online later in the autumn, this should be available to users as a service. We want to generalize this, and Andy mentioned yesterday a project called Pandas, uh, which was a proposal led by the SRF to build a very general infrastructure to do this, uh, federated across different institutions, uh, using ICAT, or, or rather using metadata as a, a controlling feature at the top, as Andy mentioned yesterday, and then providing virtualized cloud access to users to, to data and analysis tools. Um, as a general service, this wasn't funded um, looked at very well, but, but, but not actually funded. But we think this is tremendous importance. We are pursuing this anyway, um, and on a much lower level locally. So this, this really doesn't make sense to anybody, but this is a kind of architecture of what we're setting up in this area. So we can provide in the middle sort of private cloud access to uh, uh, analysis tools for user communities, uh, which talks to our data backplane, um, our Data store, which we already have the data already in, in, in the center, in the archives. Um, access to uh, high performance computing resources, various high performance computing resources in the top, top, top right. Um, and then provide users with various interfaces to access those tools in a very general way. Uh, and all backed up by, by capturing metadata as we go along for the provenance of what's, going, what, what's happening. Um, so, move, so, one area we're, we're, we're working on. Second area we've done a lot of work on is sharing and publishing data. Um, so this is where, so we've been issuing DOIs for data sets for ISIS for some time, for ISIS data, uh, and this is actually beginning to get used. So this is very similar to what Susanna's been talking about with the crystal structures we do it for experiments, so, uh, and the raw data associated with experiments. So there's a DOI somewhere in this paper, uh, or you can go and look through the, the data site metadata search for, for ISIS metadata for the same for the same DOI that's in the paper. Um, that will come down to a to a page that we have, which may may provide some more information about the about the, the data set and data collection process. Uh, and then, given the right permissions, you can go off onto well, the top cat system and, and go and access the data yourself. So this is open data. It's after. Uh, it fits within the data with ISIS's data policy of releasing data after three years. Um, I'm publishing data that way. So hopefully getting more take up and also um, uh, mechanisms for doing linking to data and tracking the whole research object is, is a 
the various artifacts that happened in, in the experiment. Whoops, my time is up according to that. Um, the, one of the other things we've been doing on publishing metadata is publishing to general purpose harvesters as well. So there's quite a number of these being produced by the, by the, by kind of the, the data community in general across all disciplines. So this is one of the project called EUDAT, which is building data infrastructure across disciplines in Europe. They have a data discovery service called the EB Defined. So we've, we've published ISIS metadata with the same data that's, that's in data site actually. Uh, to to that uh, discovery service, uh, and we've been so we've been mapping from the ICAT metadata to this to the metadata which they provide. They they have a much simpler set of metadata than ICAT, uh, 17 fields or so is in the sort of doubling core um, uh, for for this discovery general purpose discovery metadata. Um, and, and one of the ways we want to take that is a new project called NFO Europe. Which is, on, which is called Nanostructures, Nanoscience Boundaries and Fine Analysis project. We're just about to start. It was mostly about transnational access to to, to facilities, uh, both large and, and, uh, and small scale facilities. Um, but there's a significant part of this which is on data management and sharing uh, of the scientific experiments. So we want to publish uh, the data generated in the project and, and manage it into a data infrastructure similar to what we've been doing in a, in a federated way. I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later. So back to metadata, some final words. Um, so what we're kind of getting towards in this talk is sort of three levels of metadata. Um, so very general discovery metadata, uh, which allow people to search for things and which are used for search engines. Um, so Dublin Core Seek and EU, uh, EU dat, data site sort of level, they tend to have sort of between 10 and 20 fields, very general. Uh, systems like Drive, Big Share, and Zenodo, which were mentioned yesterday, that's one of this kind of level. But you, this is where you typically also associate your, your DOIs. You probably need to add some domain specific terms and control vocabularies if you really want to make it very useful. Um, and then there's a the sort of data which we've been talking about in this talk. Uh, which I call access metadata, or you could call it structural metadata, or control metadata, or something. So it's much more talking about how data is organised, who it belongs to, how it's accessed, what was done, what was the, what was done to it, uh, sort of provenance, uh, and this is where where data can be used in the data management process to control things as well. So the sort of things in CSMD and other other, system, other metadata frameworks that we that are around sort of fit into this space. They're still very cross discipline. Very quite generic, um, and perhaps less generic than the discovery. And then what I think the data was much we were talking about yesterday, which we're talking about usage metadata, where we're talking much more about the samples, the parameters, the instruments, and techniques. And I think this is the area where we, you know, this area we need to combine these things together. Um, so the IPOP ESRF approach yesterday was, was very interesting from that point of view. But I think we'll need to provide support for all of these areas, combine them, and integrate them. Uh, and where an area of, area of collaboration, as I mentioned, is the NFA Europe project. Uh, one thing we've got to do there is metadata management. Uh, so we are in support of the information discovery. We, we need to define metadata for, for that area, uh, standards for that area so we can build this common infrastructure. Uh, and we're just about to start work with research, within the Research Data Alliance to start to, to produce some uh, common formats. Um, there's a number of existing working groups, the materials interest group, the photon neutral interest group, metadata working group, and I've now just discovered a chemistry interest group, interest group just about to start, uh, that may well be, may, may, would be very useful to, to, to start to, to take part in this. And, and there's some last starting points of what we've, what we've talked about already. There's also a co data framework for nanostructures that would be, would be very useful for starting point there. So that's something I would like to. I mean, I, I'm leading this, so I'd really like to collaborate on that, on that activity. Uh, final plug is um, there is, while we're talking about co-data, there is a co-data data journal which has recently been launched, uh, or relaunched, um, uh, and with, which is dedicated to articles on data science uh, and policies, practices, and management. Uh, and, and, well, you can read this. Um, so, kind of general issues around data. Um, I've recently been appointed. Well, I've recently been appointed section editor of a large-scale data facilities, 
Um, so uh, I'm plugging that as, as a possible place for, for publishing more information about this sort of thing. So final word, uh, management of large data, raw, data, raw data is complex and do well when you good systematic metadata collection, automate as much as possible and track what happens to the data. Extend the support across the life cycle as much as possible uh, with data analysis and publication, linking data from different sources um, uh, and support building this whole notion of the whole research object. We don't really want to preserve data and ultimately we want to preserve science. Um, and data, metadata may well be at different, use, different levels. And we should be acting, and in fact we use this part of our computing infrastructure. Okay, so I'm sorry I've overrun a little bit, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Questions? Uh, Mike, Mike Wall, uh, Los Alamos. So I noticed that you use Google Code as a, uh, Yeah, right. It's in two days that's going to become uh, yeah, no, read only. That, so. that must be an old URL. It's now on um, GitHub. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I did the same thing with my project. So, um, and that kind of brings me to the point uh, about this. So, how long do you envision keeping? this raw data at your facility? Is there some sort of a sunset on, on data? Depends on the facility. I mean, uh, ISIS, whose total data collection in the grand scheme of things is relatively small, about half a, half a petabyte in total, um, have kept all the data they've, raw data they've ever collected back to 1982. Um, and have no plans to stop doing that. Um, Diamond, because they are much, oh sorry, and, and ISIS also have a much more rigorous data policy which says that. So they actually state it that they will have best efforts to keep data as long as possible. Um, Diamond, because of the data volumes, and partly because of the culture, um, and synchrotrons, have much less commitment. They have, they have kept all the data they've, they've generated, so they've archived it. I don't guarantee to. Um, um, and whilst they plan to keep on doing it, they, they have to seriously consider this exponential growth. You know, some of our projections are quite frightening in what, what data they might have in five years' time. Uh, and that is a cost implication. It's not, not, we, we have capacity, but there is, so we can do it, no problem, but there's, it's a cost implication. It's whether they want to keep on doing that, and that's a matter of whether they get the value from the community. So if there's demand from the community, like you guys, to say, we really want to keep this, particularly, or to triage data sets you really want, then the pressure, you know, the, there'd be much more incentive for them to do, to do so. Yeah. Brian, it's obviously an exemplary uh, effort that's going on here, <laughs> um, and we made an extensive uh, investigation as a working group, and congratulations on that. Admittedly, uh, some time ago, but I went to the ISIS website to access data that was more than three years old. Um, it wasn't clear to me um, what I could access, and what I tried in a random sort of way uh, consistently led to the request for a username and password. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's the, if you will, the management of the interface to the person like me who randomly comes along and, and, and well, perhaps not so randomly, to, to yeah. get access to data that is more I, than three years. I, I, I entirely agree. Um, there are two aspects there. Firstly, there, there is a username and it's, 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 it's free. You, have, you can register for, anyone can register, essentially. Anyone with a if, if you know, like Mickey Mouse dot at Google, more probably, you know, probably wouldn't, but you know, anyone else with a digital email address can, can, can register. It's free from that point of view. Um, it's not particularly clear and it's not particularly easy to use. We, we know this. Um, in fact, one of the things we're doing at the moment is we're changing the interfaces. We're, we've got new versions of interfaces of some of the tools coming, you know, hopefully, well, about now or the next few months, to change a lot of that. So we, we know there's, there are problems in that area. 
You probably have lots of guinea pigs, but if you need another one, I'd be happy to okay. uh, oblige. Okay. Let's thank Brian again. Thank you very, very much.